main part of the Linux conference. Miniconfs are over, so it's over to us volunteers to do all the intros. So my name is Steve. I'm one of your volunteers. I'm actually from the Gold Coast. If anyone wants to ask about Gold Coast stuff, you can find me anytime, and I will try and be your tour guide. Um, so this is our first talk of the day. And this speaker is very well known to a lot of you. He's been to a number of Linux comps before. I've seen him talking about the X-Window system, but also about things like rockets and all sorts of other hobbies he has. Today, he's talking about something I had no idea about. It's a, and as an embedded developer, I'm quite excited about this. It's called SNEC, and it's a Python-inspired language for tiny embedded computers. So please welcome everyone, Keith Packard. I expect the microphone is working by now. My name is Keith Packard. I've been uh, coming to LCA since 2004 when we had an event in Adelaide. Um, I would like to remind everybody that at that event, there were free ice creams every day for every attendee. <laughs> Someday, I keep coming back to LCA hoping that happens again. So far, I've been disappointed. Uh, so I want to talk to you about a project that I started last December, just before the last LCA. Um, I've been involved in education. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work today. Uh, in education, hello. Yes. Uh, teaching um, grades uh, five through seven or so. Uh, students, how to do programming. Uh, we build robots out of Lego and attach computers to them and drive them around the classroom. Um, it's fantastic fun. I've been working with an amazing educator. Uh, who has uh, just recently retired after 30 years of science and technology education. Uh, my children were uh, able to be taught by her, and I felt an obligation to help out. Um, so at the time the children entered the class that I've been involved with, they've had, got a, uh, three or four years of uh, Lego-based instruction already, so they're really good at building Lego. Um, uh, this environment is an extremely privileged environment, and I realize that. We have a lot of uh, parent and teacher, uh, teachers helping out in the class, and I'm one of those. Um, we actually teach the students three languages at the same time, in the same period of time. We teach them Logo. How many of you have heard of Logo? Hooray! Uh, we teach them a RoboLab, which is a blocks-based language uh, using the, the RCX bricks that are uh, familiar with, the, with, uh, with Lego. And then we've also been teaching them until this, uh, until last year, I've been well, I was teaching them uh, plain Arduino and C++. Um, how many people enjoy teaching C++ to 10-year-olds? Uh, to that would not be me. <laughs> Um, it's a, so one of the key parts of this classroom environment is that it's not a competitive environment. I also, I also work with a high school team uh, doing the uh, robotics competition. Um, this classroom has none of that competitive element. Um, this, and as a result, the, the, um, the students don't have any pressure to compete. Uh, there's no expectation of winning anything. Um, and I, I feel uh, from my own experience in these two environments that, uh, that is a much more welcoming and inclusive environment for the students. Uh, so if you are, in, if you are working with uh, students and have a choice between entering a competition or doing something on your own that's cooperative, um, if you have the resources and the capacity, I strongly encourage uh, cooperative, uh, cooperative engineering environments. How many of us work in a competitive engineering environment every day? We're free software people. We cooperate. That's what we do. Uh, so let's make that happen. Okay, when I joined the program uh, some years ago, uh, this is the computer I was given to teach the, uh, the children with. It is actually an Apple II. Um, it had a card in the back that was uh, plugged into the old Apple II bus, and it connected to that little black uh, box here on the side. Uh, and you could uh, do kind of static robots. Uh, they couldn't move around because they were tied to the Apple II. Um, we built a lot of robots out of Lego, but they couldn't move. So here's a, here's a pen plotter. We could draw circles with the circles and logo uh, a lot like you would with turtle graphics. Um, this also used the logo language. So we had kind of two slight variants on logo, one on the Apple II and one on the Macintosh. Um, this one sadly died under my watch. Uh, something bad happened and the magic smoke was emitted from the back of the Apple II um, and it was no more. Uh, we decided not to replace the Apple II uh, at kind of my insistence that we move into a slightly more modern computing era. Um, I first in, encountered the Apple II as a child, which gives you an idea of how long ago the Apple II was popular. Um, I, I think my first Apple II experience was in 1978, uh, which is a few years ago. So I was teaching with this uh, up to about five years ago. 
Yeah, exactly. So this computer survived from 1978 until 2015 um, and kept running, uh, which is an impressive testament. Uh, I don't think any laptop uh, at that age would still be working. Certainly its batteries would die. I bet the power supply capacitors would have all dried out. But this one kept chugging until I think it was probably my fault. I probably plugged a card in wrong, uh, turned the computer on, and, and smoke was emitted. But uh, that gave me an opportunity, hooray. Um, here's what logo code looks like for those of you not familiar. It is actually a transliteration of Lisp, uh, which is kind of odd to te be teaching uh, language from the 50s to children, uh, but it is kind of cool. Um, this is the, the way that you talk to the robot uh, in logo. Uh, the perimeters are very simple. They take usually just one parameter. Um, and this is a, a loop that blinks the light. You talk to output number one, you turn it on. Uh, of course, in, in, in the Apple environment, there weren't floating point numbers. Oh my God, that would be so hard. The Apple logo only had integers and they wanted to use, uh, they wanted to offer delays of less than a second. So everything is in multiples of tenths of second. Uh, and so oftentimes one of the introductory parts of the class was to talk about fractions and multiples. And so we actually had to talk about the fact that these were tenths of second. And so one of the little exercises we do, so what, what happens if you want to delay for five seconds? And the children would ponder that and eventually come up with the answer of 50. So here, this blinks the light on and off, a uh, second on and a second off forever. Pretty simple. Uh, so after the Apple II exploded, uh, I, I decided to try Arduino. I've had a lot of experience pro, uh, using uh, Arduinos with high school and college students, and I thought, well, what the heck? How hard can this be? Uh, the hardware is very inexpensive. Um, it is something that you can take out of the LEGO robotics program and move into a science fair. You can move it into a college environment. Uh, we had a number of students actually take the Arduino uh, experience they had and go on to develop much more sophisticated robots uh, and show them at science fairs. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, obviously programming in C++. Um, it turns out that C++ is a complicated language. Um, and if you're a middle school student, um, it turns out to be a challenge, uh, be especially because of all the typing required. Um, and I'll show you why that, uh, why that was a, a significant problem. Um, m a lot of the instruction time when teaching with the Arduino turned out to be just telling the students, you're going to have to put a curly brace there, you need to put a semicolon there. And there wasn't any good reason for that because obviously the computer should have been able to figure it out. It was like, well, it's indented. Why does it need curly braces? Um, it was just, you know, I spent an awful, awful lot of time uh, leading the students through how to, how to operate the C programming language, especially dealing with types and declarations and include files and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the performance was absolutely amazing. Uh, I had a student um, build a, a line bot, which is a robot that follows a line. I wish I could have brought the robots with me, uh, but I ha the class hasn't, uh, did, hasn't restarted since the Christmas holidays, um, and so I was unable to get any robots along with me. But it was a line following robot. It has a light sensor and a light, um, and it shines on the table, um, and it follows the edge of a, of a piece of tape, which is darker or lighter than the table, and it follows it along by, it's a very simple program. I think I, think I have that in the presentation. Uh, a student took that program and took his calculus knowledge in, 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 uh, in grade 11, I think it was, um, and actually built a, a PID controlled robot using the Arduino. Uh, PID is a fairly sophisticated control mechanism, uh, proportional inter uh, integral differential. So the, 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 the thing that warmed my heart was a student had learned how to build the robot as a, as a grade five and had worked with other students, helping them learn how to do this as a, as a teaching assistant. And then in grade 11 decided to take that basic robot and turn it into something more, a lot more real. Uh, PID, PID uh, algorithms are used in industrial robots all over the world. Uh, he got calculus credit for that. He took it to the science fair. Uh, his line following robot could zip around the line and, and never waver. It, it didn't, it was very smooth. It was amazing. And that was all because he was using C++ on the Arduino and it had the performance he needed. Uh, the same is not true of any of the interpretive language we were using. They just aren't fast enough to do that. Okay. So this is the Arduino code that does this exact same thing. I think you probably all are familiar with the Arduino, or at least many of you. Uh, you have to write two separate functions for the Arduino. I have no idea why. Uh, somebody thought this was a cool idea. You have to tell it before you can use a pin. Oh, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna use this pin as an output. Well, I'm calling digital write right here. Why do I have to tell it up here in a separate function that I wanna use it as an output? Well, that's just because that's what the computer wants. 
<clears throat> so as you can see, there's an enormous amount of typing. Obviously, we didn't have the students typing any comments, but even still, there's a lot of punctuation. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of extra text. The, the uh, words are very long, digital write. LED, you know, and you've got some pound defines to tell it about what the, what the LED was. Um, this would typically take the students, uh, the grade five students, about 30 minutes just to type in. Uh, so that's 30 minutes of instruction time watching them operate a keyboard. Uh, not very profitable use of their time or my time. Uh, of course, the first thing the student sees when programming in C is functions. Uh, you can't, there is no in interactive me uh, mechanism in C. Um, and also you have to compile the code and download the code before it will do anything. And that means the experimentation cycle for when you're teaching the, the student the introductory bits, like, well, here's how you turn a light on. Uh, you have to spend a lot of time getting to the point where the student actually knows how to operate the IDE, download code, uh, and operate the robot. So it, it, just that, the feedback from, here's a new idea I want to introduce. Here's how we're going to do it on the robot, and here's how much code you have to type in order to do that. Uh, we did a lot of uh, taking an existing program and modifying it slightly in order to speed that up. Um, and after about three years, the program got to be running pretty well uh, so that you wouldn't actually have to type a complete Arduino program but once uh, the very first time, and that helped a lot. Um, it was really cool that we could have standalone robots. It was really cool that we were using uh, free software to do all the development. It was really cool that we were teaching the students a skill they could take beyond the Lego program. We weren't teaching them a, a language that was, uh, that was, that was uh, locked into this educational environment. We we're teaching them skills they could move forward. So we learned a lot about how to, how to get uh, students to understand what skills they were learning that were gonna be useful later on and what skills were specific to the Lego environment. So that was really cool. Uh, here's an example of uh, one of the things the students did with this. Uh, so this is, this is a, the, a single Arduino driving a bunch of LED controllers. And as you can see, it's, it's uh, actually PWMing or making the lights change in intensity. Uh, there were hundreds of LEDs. Um, this took the students, uh, I, I, I built the PWM boards for them and they programmed it up. Uh, this took the, uh, the grade 10 and 11 students about uh, three or four weeks to get the programming to work. Uh, there was absolutely no way we were going to do something of this complexity uh, with the grade 5 students, which, which showed to me that the notion of uh, teaching the, uh, the students advanced Arduino programming um, at grade 5 and 6 was just not feasible. It was too hard. There was too much to learn. It took too much time. Uh, let's see. Uh, so. After this point, I've taught uh, using C++ for about five years, um, and I decided I really want to rethink the program and try to come up with a way to take the good things that we've gotten out of us, the fact that you're taking skills that are going to be useful later in your education or uh, our career, um, the fact that it was fairly low level and the students could touch and interact with the hardware directly. Uh, we certainly loved the notion of building robots out of Lego. That was fantastic. Um, but I wanted to make it, I wanted to take it back a level and make it easier for the student to, students to use. And I remembered my days as a young child playing with my very first Z80 based computer programming in BASIC. How many of you have uh, learned how to do computer programming with BASIC? Yeah. Wasn't it fantastic? You turn the computer on and you type stuff at it and it did stuff right away. Uh, here's a really popular, uh, popular program, right? It uh, says, hello world. Um, and actually does some fairly complicated things. It, it, uh, it, it uh, does the hello world and beeps at you. Uh, so that's pretty fun. Uh, you could obviously type this out really quickly and interact with the computer directly. And I'm like, yeah, I want something like that. I want something a lot like that. Similar scale, the entire language is small enough that I can describe not a subset of the language, not a carefully curated list of functions, please don't go beyond these, but to teach the students the entire language in a couple of hours. Um, I wanted it small enough to run on our existing uh, Atmega 328 hardware, um, and BASIC certainly would have done that. Um, the problem with BASIC is that it's a dead language, right? Nobody uses BASIC today. I guess there's still some visual BASIC stuff going on in the world, but BASIC in, at this level, uh, there aren't commercial applications of that. When you go to college, there's nobody doing research using BASIC programs. So I thought, wait a minute, BASIC is not the language that I want for this, but I want the same experience, right? So what I really want 
is I want something that's a lot like Python. Python has a lot of the same feel of basic. It's got a read eval print loop, which means you can interact with it directly. Um, it can run on fairly small computers, I hoped. Uh, I really wanted to run it on the uh, at Mega328. Uh, so we've come up, I came up with a Python subset uh, called SNEC that I'm talking about today. It is exactly Python compatible. I have a test suite for SNEC. Uh, every time you commit to uh, the, the SNEC repository, adding a test or adding, a new, uh, uh, adding some fixes to SNEC, I run the test suite against Python and I run the test suite against SNEC and the two are required to have identical answers. And that means that when you write a SNEC program, it will run in Python, except for the SNEC special functions, which don't exist in Python. I wanted to have, I, ideally I would have loved to have just a, a screen connected to the robot with a keyboard and interact with it directly. Um, Hardware-wise, that's really hard, uh, trying to get a screen wired up and all that kind of stuff. So I settled on using a laptop with an IDE uh, that's on the desktop. Uh, just a, uh, a, a, a simple editor and uh, interaction window. Uh, so there are actually two IDEs available for SNEC. The first is one that I wrote in Python, of course, as one does, uh, called SNEC DE, and that was the first one that I wrote uh, because it looked uh, essentially identical to the logo environment the children were used to. Uh, it split the screen into two parts. At the top part was a text editor, and the bottom part was an interaction window. Uh, this is a very common pattern, and it turned out that after I was all done writing my derpy little Python uh, uh, development environment, I found online this Mu development environment. And I'm like, ooh, that looks just like what I have, except competently done. Yeah, we'll use that. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, so. The, uh, the challenge here, of course, is that you need to be able to plug your device into, into a USB uh, spigot and get it to talk to uh, the operating system. Uh, it turns out with Windows 10, you finally don't need device drivers to talk to serial devices from Windows. Uh, and of course, with the Macintosh and Linux or POSIX systems, they're sensible, they never have required that. So I don't need any operating system drivers. I need a Python program to run on your desktop, um, a USB port, and this device, and that's all you need. So it's a pretty lightweight development environment, and it's even easier to install than are the Arduino environment, because you don't have to have a compiler. Uh, the compiler is actually going to be in this board here. Uh, let's see. Oh, the other awesome part about using USB, there's a couple of reasons I wanted to use USB connections for uh, the SNEC environment. The first, uh, first benefit is that if the device has a battery, you can charge it while you're programming it. Uh, I've been using the battery-powered uh, SNEC boards here that I'll talk about later uh, all semester, all the, the first half of the academic year in, uh, in America, uh, and we have never had to intentionally charge the boards. And that means just the, just the amount of time they spend plugged in uh, while programming them and, and dinking around with them in the, in the interactive loop is sufficient to keep the batteries charged. And that was really nice. It's like, oh, I just ca they just casually happen to remain fully charged all the time. I don't have to worry about it. That's not true with a Bluetooth connected device. Uh, the other challenge with Bluetooth is if you have 20 students in a room, each with a Bluetooth device and each with a Bluetooth tablet, the teacher typically spends a week trying to make sure that every device is paired with the right tablet. Uh, you, wires kind of solve that problem in a really straightforward fashion. Uh, I, I got that piece of advice from an educator who actually tried to do Bluetooth connected devices in a classroom environment and had, uh, had torn most of her hair out as a result. She was very frustrated by that. Uh, so those are kind of the, those are kind of the hardware goals. Uh, here's a line bug. That's uh, so what I was talking about uh, uh, in SNEC. You can see it zipping around there. I'm sorry about the blinky video. That's what LibreOffice does when you have two screens. If you only have one screen, it works, uh, works much better. But you can see here, here, there's no functions here, right? This is just direct Python code. Um, anybody recognize anything not Python in that? That looked pretty Pythonic. Pretty good, huh? Seem like you can understand what it does. You talk to the motor, you make it go to the right, and then you turn it on, and so the robot twists to the right. Uh, it turns, motor, uh, turns the right wheel going forward. Um, and then you're checking the light sensor, waiting for the value to get brighter, which is to say you're looking for it to become, to, for the light to get over the white area. And then you turn that motor off, and then you turn the other motor on and make, it, and make the robot uh, slew to the left, and then wait for the light to become dark. And then you turn that motor off, and then you keep going. Um, and you, I can teach this, this, uh, this, uh, this style of programming uh, in about 40 minutes uh, to most students. 
Uh, so we get them building a robot that does something on the ground in about 40 minutes. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of experimentation. Uh, in particular, here's a magic value for you. Uh, that's the intensity at which it's kind of the median intensity between what the light sensor returns when it's over white and what it returns over black. And we discover this value before we start programming interactively, just by placing the robot over the dark section, querying the light sensor in the, in the, in the, uh, in the interactive mode, placing it over the light, querying it again, and then doing some averaging. I don't typically make them, make them add the two values and divide. I typically just say, what's something that's kind of between those two values? And the students are pretty good at picking values, uh, picking numbers between the values. Now these are grades five through seven students. They have some experience with decimals. Uh, and so I'm able to use decimal values. And that works pretty well. Um, there is another uh, Python that runs on tiny computers called MicroPython or CircuitPython. How many of you have, you have played with MicroPython or CircuitPython? Yeah, absolutely. It's a fantastic development environment. I've done a few projects using that. Um, uh, the board that I just showed you, there's a port of CircuitPython to that board uh, available uh, in the usual CircuitPython environment. It's a fantastic language. It is real Python. There's, there's no doubt about it. You can say MicroPython all you like, but and yet it's basically the entire Python language. Um, it is much, a much larger language as a result than SNEC is. Uh, you can see here um, for the same board, uh, the SNEC environment's about, you know, about you know, 64 kilobytes and the MicroPython environment is 256 kilobytes. Um, and that means that um, the language is larger and harder to learn because uh, it's much more sophisticated. Um, and it takes, uh, it takes the over the entire resources of the board that I've been using here uh, to the point where program storage has to be done in an off, off um, outside of the SOC in a separate part. Um, the main thing from my perspective was that the time it took to get the children to be able to turn the mo first motor on or the first light on uh, took a lot more commands. And we'll look at that here, right? Here is the MicroPython program that does exactly the same thing uh, as, the, uh, as the Arduino code. And I'll show you this next example uh, on the next slide. You have to, you, again, you have to import a bunch of declarations to say, oh, MicroPython, oh, we're actually using a specific bunch of APIs. Uh, that we need to import into our environment. And then we have to talk about and configure the resources. This is about the same level of complexity as Arduino. It is a more friendly environment because you have that interactive mode, so you can do a lot of this experimentation interactively. Uh, but it, still, you have, to, uh, you have to do a lot of typing and uh, explore the environment uh, in a lot more depth before anything happens on the robot. Uh, this isn't doing quite the same thing. This, uh, this, uh, this makes the, LED, uh, the LED follow a switch. Um, I don't remember why I didn't change this to do the obvious thing, but I didn't. I apologize for that. Uh, in SNEC, the example is really pretty simple. So this does exactly the same thing that previous program did, right? You're going to talk to the motor. Uh, you're going to just spin in a loop, and uh, if the switch is pushed, you turn the motor on, otherwise you turn the motor off. You can plug motor or light into these outputs. They're all the same. So you can see the contrast between what CircuitPython requires for you to do uh, a particular behavior and what you can do in SNEC. So the CircuitPython system is, is as sophisticated and as capable as a, as a full-on full Arduino. And from my perspective, that means that I'm teaching all of the complexity of the Arduino, ad admittedly with a much better language, but even still, I, the typing load on the students was, was uh, more than I was willing to, uh, willing to, uh, to um, require of them. Um, I got a lot of comments when I was using, using the C++ uh, development environment about why do we have to type so much, the computer's very picky, you know, I really don't like the fact that it takes a long time to get anything to work. Um, and when I replaced that with SNEC, I got coding is awesome. That seemed like positive feedback to me. So that was a, a, nice, a nice feedback. Um, and of course, with SNEC, because you don't have to do any of that setup, right? You can just read the input and it figures out what it needs to do to reconfigure the thing to be an input inside the implementation instead of having a programmer express that. That means when you're experimenting at the REPL, you really get that very immediate feedback. It's like, oh, if I want to read from, a, read from an input and see what its value is right now, I can just read from the input, hit return, and the value is printed, which is really nice. Okay. 
Uh, I was looking for an IDE, and I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just write a small IDE in Python. That would be easy. Uh, but then I went and found this Mu editor. How many of you have heard of the Mu uh, Python IDE? Yeah, this is a project which should get more love. It gets quite a bit of love, admittedly, but it's a fantastic, fully, uh, fully capable IDE for programming in Python, MicroPython, CircuitPython, and I've got patches for SNEC now. That means you can, you, can do, uh, you can use the IDE to develop Python applications on the desktop. So if you want to write, if you want to write simple applications that do things on your, on your laptop, you can use Mu for that. Um, and it also has a bunch of USB device support for devices that run Python connected via USB. So things like the BBC Microbit, uh, things like all the circuit Python boards from, from Adafruit, all of those have support built into Mu. When you plug them in, Mu says, hey, I found a new device for you. Would you like to talk to it? Um, so it's extremely, extremely easy for the, for the, uh, for the new user uh, who doesn't need to learn what the COM ports are named or what the baud rates need to be set to. Uh, you don't have to go and configure what kind of device is connected to that like you do in Arduino because in the Python environment, those USB IDs are sufficient for the system to say, oh, I know what's connected out there. It's this kind of board. Uh, in, the, in the Arduino environment, uh, because you're often talking to an FTDI chip or some other serial to USB converter, the USB IDs are not sufficient for you to know what kind of board it is. So the user actually has to go in and configure in the Arduino IDE what kind of board is connected. Let me tell you, the number of times I have misconfigured the Arduino IDE and said, why isn't my program working? I keep downloading this code and it does nothing. And then you go to the little configuration uh, menu in the IDE and it says, oh, you're currently programming an Arduino Uno instead of an Arduino. <laughs> it's like, oops. Um, so getting rid of errors like that is a tremendous, a tremendous benefit for having devices that identify over USB. Uh, let's see, uh, the Mu has a built-in reformatter, it has a built-in syntax checker, it has built-in documentation. You type the name of a function in Mu, and the Mu editor has documentation, says, oh, it pops up a little pop-up. This function does this. It wants these parameters. So it leads to, it's like a competent IDE almost. It's amazing. Uh, so it really helps the students uh, uh, learn while they're typing. The system is very responsive. Uh, and so you don't, uh, you end up not having to, to tell the students so much, they're able to explore it on their own. Uh, one of the things I really like to be able to do um, is pair the students, uh, one student who has learned the system previously and one who's learning it now, I love to be able to pair them together and have them go explore some new idea together while I sit back and watch. Uh, that's teaching the older students some mentorship skills, teaches the new student that they too will be able to learn and, and teach in the future. And, uh, and it, but, it, but a system which is self-documenting like this means that the mentor has to have a lot fewer skills and a lot less, uh, a lot less uh, you know, readily available knowledge about the system and they can learn it together. Um, I'm hoping that somebody who is uh, influenced with the MU project will, hel will help to uh, merge my SNEC patches. Uh, they're sitting there waiting on a pull request. Uh, I know the Mu editor folks have a lot of, a lot of stuff going on, uh, so I'm hoping they're gonna merge it in. Here's what uh, uh, Mu looks like. Uh, it, has, it says at the top you're editing code, at the bottom you have a little REPL down there. Um, it's got all those, uh, all those nice shiny buttons at the top that let you uh, reformat your code or, or check it. Uh, there's documentation with help and all this kind of stuff. So the, the interface is fairly discoverable, which was nice. Uh, here's something that blinks the, the LED for one, one second on, one second off. So this is the one that I wrote. Uh, I wrote it with no knowledge of Mu. I hadn't even uh, uh, seen that it existed. Uh, does it look a little similar? Yeah, basically the same plan, but of course it's written in curses. How many people love to show people curses UIs in 2020? Yeah, it's a little embarrassing. Um, it was something easy for me to do, and it means that this, uh, the advantage of SNEC DE is that it's a completely self-contained Python 3 program, right? It doesn't have libraries, it doesn't have an immense, immense dependency chain. So if you're running in a more primitive environment, like say Debian stable, um, you can get <laughs> SNEC DE running by just downloading the .py file, which is kind of convenient. So uh, when I get stuck, uh, with a st if a student brings in their own laptop and wants to experiment with stuff, I can try to get Mu installed, and if that fails, at least we have this to fall back on. And the, the fact that they are very similar uh, in style makes it reasonably easy to do. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the implementation of SNEC. We got about uh, 15 minutes left. 
Uh, so in my world, I like to think of languages classified in three different ways. Uh, there's direct interpretation languages, which essentially execute the code as typed. Right, there's no, there's no compilation to bytecode, there's no machine code. You really are interpreting a data structure representation of this original syntax of the language. And BASIC and LISP to me are languages of that ilk. Uh, BASIC will tokenize your, 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 um, your input as you type it in, and then when you execute it, it interprets the tokens directly. Uh, LISP similarly converts your, your um, bracket notated, uh, notated input into tokens directly uh, in uh, linked list form and execute executes those directly. Uh, uh, at, the, at, in, in the, at, at the other end of that, we have fully compiled languages, which take source code uh, in a particular syntax and emit object code that runs directly on the processor. So C and Fortran and Rust, things like that. In the middle, uh, which are actually the newest class of languages, are these bytecode interpreted languages. I think Smalltalk may have been one of the first of those. Um, I don't know if Simula was bytecoded. I don't have any, I've never used Simula. Uh, but they're byte-coded languages, and they're actually compiled. Think people think of Python and Perl and Ruby as interpreted languages, which is semi-true, but the, the original syntax of the program is actually compiled into a virtual machine, and it's that virtual machine which is interpreted. So because of that, because Python really cannot be directly interpreted, uh, to have a Python system means you have a compiler and an interpreter which is kind of a lot more than basic. And so all of a sudden, when I, when I looked at the architecture of building a Python-like language, I realized it was gonna be bigger than basic. There's no way you can have a, a runtime system and a compiler in the same amount of memory as basic could have its tokenizer, which is all the input did, and uh, a simple interpreter on top of that. Okay, so this NEC implementation contains a compiler, a virtual machine, uh, some hardware support for a particular target, and a memory manager. Uh, memory management in BASIC was really easy. You typed a variable name, you got an allocated variable space. About the only thing hard in BASIC was strings, and there was a separate buffer for strings, and they were kind of mangled around up there. Uh, and so the memory management in BASIC was fairly simple. Python requires garbage collection. Oh, yay, because you have objects that are gonna be growing and shrinking, like lists and tuples. Uh, dictionaries can get things added and subtracted, and so you have a lot of dynamic memory going on. And so I knew the memory manager was gonna be um, a bunch of work. Um, fortunately, I had done a bunch of memory managers in the past. Okay, now in order to make a little language, I really needed to pare down the kinds of objects uh, that SNEC was gonna uh, be providing. Um, I had remembered this hack from a long time ago involving uh, IEEE floats that I'll show you on the, on the next slide, I think. Uh, so I wanted to support 32-bit floats, right? I didn't wanna support only integers. Integers are a very strange thing to try to teach to children uh, because these children have, at grade five or six have already done a lot of fractions work. They've been exposed to decimal notation. They understand that there are numbers between one and two. Um, it's very natural to say if you want to delay for a half a second, you don't delay for five tenths of a second, you delay for 0.5 seconds. Uh, the, 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 uh, learning, the, the additional learning burden necessary to talk about fractions or milliseconds or deciseconds or whatever you want I just skip all of that by expressing things in fractional form using decimal notation. So I really wanted 32-bit floats, just like BASIC had. I need some simple data structures. Uh, Python's basic data structures are tuples, lists, and dictionaries. I'm sure you're familiar with those if you've ever touched Python. I wanted strings so that the children could, uh, could uh, print messages out. Um, I needed to be able to have compiled functions as objects, because Python makes those very clearly. An object which has a first class representation, you can assign them, you can pass them as values, you can do whatever you want. Um, obviously the system was gonna have a lot of built-in functions, and then I needed some constants. True, false, none, that kind of thing. Okay, so I wanted 32-bit floats, but I wanted all my objects to be representable in 32 bits. So what do we do? Well, I remember this hack. If you look at the representation of IEEE floats, it's got this special value called nan, which is not a number. How many nans are there? Well, it turns out that any number with all ones in the exponent, other than, other than, uh, other than infinity, uh, is a nan. That's a lot of nans. There's 16 million of them. So I could actually encode pointers as, as not a numbers and still directly address 16 megabytes. Thank you. Uh, which was awesome, right? 
So what I did is I said, okay, I'm gonna have the pointers uh, only be addressable on four byte boundaries, so my minimum object size is four bytes, and I'm gonna steal the bottom two bits of the NAND value as a tag. And now I have four different types of objects that I can represent uh, using these pointers. And so I have 32-bit floats, everything which is not a NAND, and then I have pointers, which is everything which is a NAND, and then I have uh, four different kinds of pointers. I can, point at, I can point at strings, I can point at lists, I can point at functions. That's plenty of, plenty of different types. So that was a cute hack. Uh, okay, this net compiler. Well, I first compiler I wrote, of course, I wrote the parser in Bison. Uh, the Bison tables were ginormous, and I thought, oh, sigh. What am I gonna do here? Do I have to do a recursive descent parser? Again, I hate those. They're really tedious to fix. Uh, and I thought, oh, wait a minute, I know what I can do. I, can, I had this old LL, uh, which is a much smaller language, which Python actually happens to be compatible with, a much smaller set of languages, um, table-driven parser generator that I'd written in Lisp oh, 40 years ago or so. Uh, and I said, oh, I know what I can do. I can just take the ideas and that and just write a new LL table-driven parser generator. Fantastic. So I wrote, uh, I took my old Lisp program and translated it into Python. So now I have the Lola uh, uh, LL parser generator. It generates ex intensely compressed parser tables. Uh, parsing's performance is definitely not key. Parser table size is the plan. I wrote a lexer by hand because you always end up doing that. Of course, I tried a lexer in flex, and it was similarly huge. I think it was 12 kilobytes uh, for a lexer for Python. It seemed kind of crazy. Uh, the other thing interesting is the, the compiler does something that is essentially the same as the old KNRC compiler. The compiler in the, in the processing stages of the parser, it's directly emitting bytecode. So it's very easy to read the compiler and see what instructions are going to be generated for any particular Python primitive. The entire compiler is 1,500 lines of code. Lexer, parser, code generation, the whole thing, except for the parser generator, which is separate. Okay, so here's what Lola input looks like. It looks a little like, uh, a little like Bison. Uh, the actions are, are these things enclosed in at signs, and um, that's just C code that gets emitted when that, when that, uh, when that part of the, the parse happens, so you can recognize names. Um, so in Lola, I get about uh, 4,800 bytes of, uh, of code and data for the parser, and uh, the Bison one was about 10 kilobytes. So I saved about six kilobytes by generating a new parser. Hello. Here we go. Here's more Lola examples. We don't have to go through that. Just to give you a flavor of what it looks like to write uh, the while statement uh, in, in Lola. So it's pretty easy to edit because you can just go whack this code around and you get a new parser every time. Okay, the SNEC virtual machine, this is the execution style. Uh, I've done a, a few virtual machines for other languages. The style I've, I've kind of settled on is a stack machine with an, with an explicit accumulator register. Uh, the accumulator means that you, can, you, can, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to push and pop the accumulator value all the time. Uh, it saves a bunch of opcodes, typically. There are 61 opcodes, um, two-thirds of which are, exp are you know, simple expression opcodes. Uh, it's a non-recursive implementation. That means it does not use the C stack at all uh, recursively. So when you call a SNEC function, it doesn't make a C function call. There's no recursion. And that's important on uh, microcontrollers because they typically have very limited stack space. Uh, here's, here's an example of SNEC bytecode. Uh, there's the, the uh, SNEC code on the left and what, the, what bytecode emits. If you've ever looked at the uh, bytecode emitted by the Python compiler, there are some similarities and some differences. It's, you know, whatever you like to do. Uh, they're essentially implementing the same sem uh, semantics with slightly different bytecode. Uh, the memory manager, this is a fun piece. Uh, so I knew that I needed to, I couldn't have two heaps of memory. And if you've ever done a memory manager using stop and copy, the typical thing that you do is you allocate the current heap and the next heap and you copy things over. Uh, that, mean, that means you have, have to have twice as much virtual address space um, as your heap is. Well, that's not gonna work when I got two kilobytes of RAM. Uh, so I needed to use a mark and sweep collector which could do things in place. Um, I, needed to be, I needed for it to be compacting because I needed to remove the space between objects so that I wasn't wasting anything and so that the heap could actually run for a long time. I wanted it to be incremental so that, it would, so that uh, each garbage collection step could take a small amount of time. You wouldn't be waiting for large garbage collection delays. Um, and again, I needed to get, uh, I needed to get, um, I needed to avoid uh, recursion uh, so that the C stack wouldn't overflow. Uh, here's kind of what it does uh, during, during memory management. 
Uh, you do a bunch of allocations and you get a bunch of little chunks of memory uh, allocated in orange. And then you go and mark all of the allocations that are still busy. You walk the entire data set the, of the program, finding where everything is busy, and you tag all of those. And then you clean up all the things that aren't being used. Uh, those are the blue, the, that are gonna remain in blue. And then, unlike a typical mark sweep collector, it has this additional step that compacts the heap and smushes everything back together. Uh, implementing this was fun. This is kind of the most fun memory manager I've done in a long time. So that was good fun. Uh, Python has some tricky bits. Uh, lexical white space is uh, very difficult to parse. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic for teaching and I wouldn't do anything else, but oh my God, it took me a long time to figure out how to make that work. Um, I learned some interesting things about Python semantics for function parameters. It turns out you can pass named parameters that have optional values positionally or by name. So there's this distinction between the invocation of function which you can either pass values uh, positionally or by name and the declaration of the function where you can either have required parameters or optional parameters. The optional parameters have equals value and the required parameters don't. So that was an interesting uh, thing I learned about Python. Uh, dictionaries. I wanted to, op uh, the initial implementation of dictionaries was just a linear search, uh, doing an equality operator looking to see if the uh, key matched the element of the dictionary. Um, I wanted to sort those, and so I actually had to order all SNEC objects. There's an absolute order of all SNEC objects. Uh, and you, I think I fixed the fact that you used to be able to compare strings versus numbers. I think it's an error now. But internally, there's, the, you can actually do that. Um, Python has this weird constant folding thing where constants that it sees the same, two, the same constant twice in the same compilation block. Um, it actually makes them be the same. And you can see that expressed in this little example. A uh, compilation block in the REPL, of course, is a single line. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting oddity in Python. I'm sorry, SNEC doesn't do that. <laughs> that was too hard. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about today is the SNEC board project. Um, I really didn't want to build hardware for this project. Uh, hardware is, is a pain to support um, and it's a lot of work to deal with. But I really need, needed something that was, had, a, had a lithium ion battery and could drive Lego motors. Lego motors take nine volts. Lego motors don't run on a single lithium battery. So I needed something that had nine volt motor controllers and a nine volt power supply that could run SNEC. So I've built this little SNEC board. Uh, there's a crowd supply campaign that is, was, uh, we hope to get started today. I don't think it's quite ready. It'll certainly start in the next day or two. If you're interested in programming in SNEC or Circuit Python and using Lego Power Functions motors, we're actually gonna be building these and selling these in the next couple of months. And with that, uh, I am all done and have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, if you wanna come down to the microphone and ask questions, or we can get ready for the next speaker. Anyone, anyone? I can ask a quick question, Keith. Absolutely. I really like your emphasis on simplicity and making things easier and, you know, wires and all that. If you could do something, what's the next thing? You should use the microphone. Yes, I should. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. I really like your emphasis on like, simplicity and things just working. You talked about wires. Like, what's the next thing you're going to simplify? What's the thing that's annoying you at the moment that you want to make easier? <sighs> uh, so um, the, the annoyance right now that we have is uh, input sensors. The SNEC board connects very naturally to motors, uh, but I need to figure out a way to connect inputs, uh, light sensors and touch sensors and temperature sensors and that kind of thing into the system and use them easily. Uh, so that's kind of a, that's kind of one of the next little steps. We have a question up here. Hello. Um, so how far along is it? I go home, I buy some Lego motors, download SNEC-DE, and get one of these boards and I can start going my kids? Yep. Yep, it's ready to go. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Keith. Uh, we'd just like to offer you a small token of our appreciation. Really enjoyed your talk today. Thank you so much. I'm impressed with Keith.